Hey folks, Craig here with another video uh, that you can consider uh, slow TV or ASMR if you prefer. Uh, but the idea is uh, we're going to hang out and we're going to relax. And So I hope you've brought a snack, maybe some tea, a handheld game, or uh, even some art of your own. That would be great. Maybe, maybe, maybe one day we'll do, we'll do some art together. Uh, we'll do a prompt together. That would be fun. Feature some, some viewer art. Uh, but the idea is we're going to unwind. Um, I'm doing some little Nemo art today. Uh, I've cut ahead due to time. I want to keep these videos at about an hour long. You know, a little bit of time, but not too long. Um, so I've, I've cut out the pencils and the ink. We've straight ahead to the, to the painting. Um, I'm not super happy with the way this came out. It, it's not bad, but, you know, um, not necessarily originally what I envisioned. I think the colors are too saturated, but well, everything's a learning experience, the good, the bad, and uh, everything in between. You might know Little Nemo from his uh, NES video game, Little Nemo, the Dream Master uh, from Capcom, which is a super difficult, but very fun game. Uh, I used to play it a lot with my cousins. The video game is based on an anime film, uh, Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. Um, and I, I've always thought that was okay, uh, but apparently it's not very well regarded. At one point, Hayao Miyazaki was uh, involved, and he famously said it was the worst thing he's ever worked on. So, eh, what do I know, I guess? But both the game and the anime are based on a comic from the early 1900s, it's over 100 years old, which is wild, uh, called Little Nemo by Windsor McKay, and this beautiful Art Nouveau inspired style, uh, just these densely packed frames, um, wonderful comic strip, there's a, there was a, an update, I don't know if a reboot is the right word here, but there is a new Little Nemo, Return to Slumberland, mm, I think from IDW, a few years ago. Uh, I don't think it's still running. I think it was pretty brief. I read a, you know, I think the first couple issues, it was all right, but it didn't stick with me in any meaningful way. But I don't know what inspired me to do uh, a Little Nemo illustration, but uh, eh, Little Nemo's fun. Um, uh, in some other news, uh, you know, I went through my old videos uh, at the behest of uh, my audience. I had made all pretty much all of my old videos private uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, I talked about my previous video and I thought, well, you know, I don't really want to make them public, but maybe there's a compromise here. Like maybe I can go through and select instead of making them all public, I can, I can pick and choose. I can surgically go in and decide what I'm comfortable with representing me as a 35 year old in the year 2019 and I found I don't know I, just shy of 100 videos I think so that's that's not too bad I demonetized them all so there shouldn't be any ads on any of them um and uh well I hope you enjoy that uh it, it's surprising because a number of people have told me oh your videos are nostalgic for me which is weird which is we I'm just a regular dude and that's weird that you know I'm nostalgic for people. But what's even weirder is that those videos were nostalgic for myself going through those videos, um, making them. But more than that, um, the period of my life, you know, when I made them, I, I made most of my videos in my 20s. And it, it gave me this newfound appreciation for my 20s. Almost like this, uh, you know, I, I, I was more grateful for my 20s, you know. I, I realized that I lived my 20s very well. Uh, I made videos. Uh, I wrote for a video game magazine. Uh, you know, as a freelancer. Um, I went to Japan. I traveled. Uh, I went to concerts all the time. I hung out with my friends, you know, at the bar or whatever, once or twice a week. I worked a lot. Um, basically, I didn't sleep. And I did a lot of stuff. And I had a, lot, I had a really good time. And... You know, I have to admit that it's it's been a trough, uh, a trough, a trough, a tough transition into my thirties. Um, basically, right when I turned thirty, I had 
you know, this major upheaval in my life, uh, my significant other who I had been with for, I don't know, seven or eight years, that ended. And then shortly after that, I was laid off from my job that I had been at for, you know, about as long, so about eight years. And then without, you know, a partner or a source of income, I, I had to, uh, I had to leave the apartment that I had been living at for quite some time. So, you know, uh, my partner, my job, my home, <laughs> uh, lost in a matter of about a year. And, uh, you know, all this stuff that you've been working towards, you know, it's just gone. And that happened basically when I turned 30. And so, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's fair to say I started from scratch, but pretty close to it at 30. And that's tough. Um, trying to find, I don't know, my sense of self and identity and all that. And being frustrated that it wasn't going to be like what it was in my 20s. Because I had a I had a blast in my 20s and I was not having a blast in my 30s. But, you know, here I am at 35 and I'm, I'm coming to grips with that. I'm feeling better about that. And I think part of that is that that gratitude, that newfound gratitude for my 20s. I think that's a good thing. Um, so it was kind of nice for me to go through my own videos, I guess. It led me down that path, so that's good. Um, beyond that, you know, I haven't, uh, haven't been up to too much. I'm going to be planning my next trip to Japan, which is going to be coming up in the spring. And uh, I've been playing Apex Legends from Respawn, that new free-to-play game. It's very good. Free-to-play games have come a long way, you know, from little puzzle games, little mobile puzzle games, to what is uh, a feature-complete multiplayer shooter. It's wild. We also had that Nintendo Direct recently, and that was a very good Direct. I enjoyed that a lot. Lots of stuff to look forward to. But that's, that's about it. Um, we're going to do some questions. Um, questions people have left in the comments in previous videos. And so if you would like your question answered in an upcoming video, uh, just leave, leave a comment. Um, you can leave a comment that isn't a question too. That's always welcome. Uh, or, or even a thumbs up. I always appreciate the thumbs up. That, that always makes me feel like I'm on the right track. First, we have uh, Graham Powell. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If I pronounce anything incorrectly, I apologize. And um, it's not it's not a question, but they say that uh, you know they recommend to me a trio of games: LOL, you know, Lack of Love on the Dreamcast, UFO, A Day in the Life on PlayStation One, and Moon Remix RPG Adventure also on the PS One. And I I do, I do not own nor have I played UFO or Moon Remix RPG um, because I don't I've never had a way to play import games on my PS1 <clears throat> excuse me uh, but I do own and have played Lack of Love um, and I think it's a really interesting game and I mean that in the best way possible I like to call it a good game or, or I think Lack of Love is beyond good or bad it is something that is, y you look at more conceptually rather than in terms of quality, I think. Um, actually, Lack of Love is on my video game shelf. It's the only jewel case on my video game. I hate jewel cases. I think they're hideous, especially when you, you know, slot them in so the spine is facing outward. Just seeing all the rows of spines of jewel cases, I think it's ugly. Uh, it's not visually appealing to me. So Lack of Love is on my it has a whole shelf to it, to itself, and it faces outward, because it's very minimalist. If you look at the cover of Lack of Love, it's just white and just says LOL, um, and I like that. It's very striking, very appealing to me. John Anton asks, can you talk about your thoughts on Breath of the Wild and the launch of the Switch? I always appreciate your content. Well, thank you. I appreciate your question. Um, well... Breath of the Wild, I would say, is my favorite game of all time now. Uh, I've said in the past that my favorite game is, was Majora's Mask, and that was true. I made a whole video about it, which I'm fairly certain I made public, so you can watch that. But I'm fairly sure that in that video, I had said that um, 
you know, if a new game came along and I, I appreciate it more than Majora's Mask, I would have to be honest with myself and say that Majora's Mask is no longer my favorite game. And that's the truth now. Uh, Breath of the Wild is. I think, I think, um, I think in large part due to the fact that I think Breath of the Wild tries, to, well, doesn't try, does a lot of what Majora's Mask does, but better. Particularly the, the melancholy and dread that pervades Majora's Mask. Um, I think Breath of the Wild does a lot of that as well, because you're dealing with a world that's basically seen the apocalypse, I guess. And, um, you know, Majora's Mask has, like, the moon hanging over as this ever-present symbol of Im- 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 impending doom. And Breath of the Wild has, like, Hyrule Castle swirling with evil right there in the center. I think both are effective. But my point being is that Breath of the Wild does a lot of similar things. And I think most of those things it does much more effectively. And then, of course, it does a number of its own things and does them very well. What a wonderful game. Uh, I think that's the game I spent the most time with, the, mo- the, the, the single-player game I spent the most time with. Multiplayer games, you know, hundreds of hours on those, Overwatch, Destiny. But Breath of the Wild, like 150 hours, is the most I've ever spent on a single-player game. It's fantastic. It's a beautiful game. My brother's playing it for the first time. Kind of jealous that he gets to see it through fresh eyes. Um <clears throat> He's asking me questions like, how do you how do you defeat the things that shoot lasers at you? And I'm like, well, have you fought a Lionel yet? He's like, no. <laughs> I just grabbed the arrows and ran away from the, from the Lionel. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, one day, son, you'll get there. Um, as for my thoughts on the launch of the Switch, uh, I was genuinely excited for the launch of the Switch. I think as an adult, I don't get excited as often. I look forward to things, which is kind of like excitement, but with a lot of the emotion removed. Um, But the Switch, I was genuinely excited for. Both my wife and I, we took took the the day after it came out off. We went to a midnight launch. We both got our own Switches. We, you know, stayed up all night playing Breath of the Wild. Um, It was great. It's a great system. I play it almost every day. I love it. Um, let's see here. James Bozentka has three questions here. And, uh, a couple of these are some heavy hitters. I don't know. Uh, number one, would you consider making these types of videos in a series where you talk about your life? Like from your earliest memories to the present. My favorite moments from you as a creator were when you got very personal and I was always interested hearing your stories of childhood and adolescence. I understand, though, if that would be too hard to do, as most of us know you had a tough upbringing. Yeah, you know, I've talked a little bit about my childhood um, before, and I've always framed that around video games. So I did a series called Context Matters, which is about, you know, our favorite games not being about, you know, the best game or the game with the best graphics or whatever. It's... It's about the context around them. And then I did another series called Return to Title, which is a bit similar, but far more story-driven, which did not gain the traction I, I wish it did. I put so much effort into Return to Title. I love that concept, and I and I, I worked really hard at that. And the people who watched it seemed to like it, but it just didn't it didn't land, unfortunately. So now that those videos are, are public, go watch Context Matters and Return to Title. I would appreciate it. Return to Title is only like four episodes. Um, I, you know, generally speaking, I don't, you know, I, I apologize. I don't know if you can hear the trains and the boats. I live, I live by railroad tracks. I live by the highway. Uh, I live by the ocean. <laughs> and not too far away, there's also an airport. So every mode of travel you can imagine, I hear out my window. And I've learned to tune it out unless I'm recording and then I become acutely aware that there's <laughs> boats and trains honking in the distance. So I apologize if that's not very relaxing. Not much I, I, not much I can do about it. I can't control the traffic. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't mind talking about my past. That's, that's, that is not a big deal for me. Uh, but what I've learned as I've gotten older is that people, not everyone, of course, um, but, a, but a significant number of people don't really have a lot of 
tolerance or patience for a middle-aged man talking about his childhood trauma. Um, a number of people seem to think that you're trying to, uh, I don't know, gain sympathy, which I'm sure some people do, but I'm not doing. Uh, I appreciate sympathy. I think that's something people don't don't really recognize. I appreciate when people are sympathetic towards me. I'm not I'm not put off by that. It, it means that people are are considering your feelings. Like that's someone putting themselves in your shoes. Uh, sympathy is a is a powerful emotion, and and I appreciate when people are sympathetic towards me. But I'm I'm not looking for that. I it's not something that I'm I'm trying to get from people. Um, or people think that you should just get over it, which is. <laughs> Uh, that the ironic thing is that as a grown adult, I can tell you that I, you know, I, I feel like I should be over it, but it, it just seems like as the years go on, it actually hurts worse. Um, which is the irony in something like that. The more distance there is, uh, just the more it stings. I don't know why. And I wish I could tell you like, nope, I'm good. I'm over it. But that's, that's actually not the case. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think a lot of people actually get over it or even the people that think they are probably express that trauma in unhealthy ways that they don't realize is actually expressing that trauma, you know, like drinking or something, you know what I mean? Um, but really it's actually, you know, your, your own family that tends to get cagey about this stuff, at least in my experience and anecdotally things that I witnessed from other families is that there's almost like this, this desire to protect the reputation and the feelings of the abuser rather than the victim and the what ends up happening is like the victim doesn't gain ownership over their own story because of that they don't have ownership over their trauma and it just it gets it, it again it gets re, it gets framed around the abuser rather than the victim it's not healthy um and even though I disagree with all of that, I'm not trying to get sympathy. I don't think necessarily you have to be over it, even if you're 35. And I don't agree with families that try to suppress this stuff. Uh, but despite all that, I still don't talk about it as much because, well, I'm not purposely trying to rock any boats, you know? I, I have a therapist for that, you know? <laughs> like, that's, I have a space for that. Here, here's, here's what I'll tell you. The Cliff Notes version my parents were abusive drug addicts. We grew up pretty poor. Um, uh, we lived in motel rooms. We lived in a homeless shelter. We lived in the spare bedrooms of family members. I would say probably about half the time we had our own apartment, but we moved around a lot. Um, so it's, you know, you know, you don't really get any stake in wherever you are, especially when it's not even your place to begin with. Um, and eventually it got so bad that the state stepped in and took me and my brother and my sister away. Um, we spent some time in a foster home. They were in one and I was in another. Um, and, uh, then later we were, we lived with our grandparents. Um, there's all kinds of like legal terms, you know, like guardianship and foster care. That's all, those are all different things and they all have actual meanings in terms of, uh, you know, legality. I don't, I don't really know what I was or what my brother and sister were, I don't know, but yeah, that's, that's the, the Cliff Notes version, uh, free of anecdotes and largely free of emotion. And you know, I, I don't mind people knowing that. I almost think it's a good thing that people know that about me. Again, I don't want to be, I don't want people to feel sorry for me necessarily, but I think it's, I think it's difficult to come out of a situation like that and not have it shape your worldview. That is a, a pretty significant component of who I am and how I am and why I do the things that I do and why I believe the things that I believe. I think that's about as far as I'll go with that. Uh, James also asks, I'm currently 22 and just doing my best to figure out life. As someone a little over a decade older than me, is there any advice you can give for me for the future? James, you hit me with these heavy hitters, man. Um, truthfully, no. I wish I could. I wish there was something I could bestow upon a 22-year-old. Um, 
but you know coming from the background that i did you know i i've done everything by the skin of my teeth really resiliency is a is a is a virtue you know i have major depressive disorder so and it's not i'm not in a depressive episode right now so it's easy for me to say this right now but bad times generally don't last and if you can see them through and work towards improving yourself and getting through to that other side again and again because that's what life usually is uh you do a lot better than a lot of other people of course if i'm in a depressive episode i'm not going to take my own advice so uh take that how you will um i would i would i would say this i would say this james um most everyone's life is some combination of hard work and opportunity even someone like me you, you came from homelessness right I'm not here just because I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. There are societal and cultural things that got me to where I am. Um, Even just small things like my first grown-up job, the one that I just uh, uh, mentioned that I was uh, laid off from earlier in the video when I was 30. Uh, I got that job um, because my friend worked there. Now, I had to work very hard to maintain that job because it it had a high turnover rate. The layoffs were frequent and brutal Uh, the fact that i lasted eight years is kind of a miracle Um, but that's because i worked hard once i had that opportunity so you know life is about recognizing opportunity taking it and then working hard to maintain it and then on top of that being proud of your hard work take pride in your work always remember to do that Um, but also remember to have some humility about how you got there about the opportunities and and the small things that you didn't necessarily do that got you there. So be be proud of your work, but always always stay humble about the stuff that you didn't necessarily do that got you there. You know, I think that applies to just about everything, not just jobs. You know. Uh, also, budget your money and stick to it like nine times out of ten. Nobody sticks to it all the time, but if you stick to a budget ninety percent of the time. You'll be doing okay. My money that will not buy you happiness, but money can certainly uh, put off some misery. That's for sure. Uh, and it's important to have a structure there. Uh, I don't have any romantic advice. <laughs> That's a whole other video, James. Um, and then finally, James asked, "What was it like to be in high school when Limp Biscuit was popular?" I don't have an answer for you. Um, Limp Bizkit was very po- their album I think it was called Significant Other wildly popular it was everywhere but I actually don't know anyone who listened to them including myself um, in fact Limp Bizkit the music strikes no nostalgia for me but just seeing the name like seeing it seeing what you wrote just reading the name in your in your comment made me more nostalgic than any of the music would it's weird it's weird what triggers nostalgia sometimes it's music that I didn't even listen to contemporaneously you take something like um oasis right what's the story of morning glory was huge when i was i think in middle school and i didn't listen to it then but you couldn't escape champagne supernova and wonderwall they were everywhere but i didn't really you know i didn't listen to them on my own but now when i listen to them because i recently got spotify and it's great spotify is great um they make me nostalgic it's weird it's weird what triggers that Limp Bizkit's not one of those things. <laughs> I was into 311. That's my secret shame. That's what I will tell you. I was very much into 311. Uh, people in my high school who didn't know Craig uh, might have known 311 Kid. They they knew they knew 311 Kid. That was me. That's my secret shame. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Super Jesus Jackson asks, "What do you think about The Last of Us? Did you play it?" Uh, no, I did not didn't it didn't interest me i know you have said in the past that you don't really care for video game stories how you recognize that a lot of video game stories are not super interesting or thought-provoking and how you were okay with that well i love playing games so you know you kind of have to be sometimes you just have to make concessions and you have to be okay with the fact that like most of them don't have very good stories um i'm not going to delve too much into that topic right here because i i know that that ruffles some feathers uh, but as someone who, you know, watches a lot of movies and reads a lot of books, I mean, just video games don't measure up. They don't. Most video game stories are power fantasies. They're, they're almost all the same. Like you're saving the world or saving the princess. 
you know, you have to have like that super huge cosmic conflict. And if you look at like books and movies and TV shows, they're not all about that. Um, and so it's, you know, you don't see a lot of video game stories that, uh, tell smaller or more personal stories. Um, sometimes within the framework of the, the cosmic conflict, there is, there are personal stories, but you know, they're few and far in between. And, and if I'm being honest, they're, they're not as well written as other media. Um, but that's how I feel. But, you know, you got to learn to tune that out. Especially, I like RPGs. I love JRPGs. <laughs> They're very cutscene and dialogue heavy, and I just mash A through them. That's why I love handhelds. That's why I love the Switch. You know, playing Tales of Vesperia on the Switch. I, you know, I really enjoy the game, but, pff, like, you know, I couldn't care less about most of that dialogue. Uh, Prezi SK asks, how did you learn to p- draw and paint? Have you ever taken some courses or something like that? Um, you know, it's my belief that, generally speaking, uh, most people are, are probably born predisposed to some kind of talent or hobby or some sort of inclination, right? Maybe born is not the right word. I don't know if it's nature or nurture, but from a young age, there's something that you're probably more inclined towards. And for me, it's always been drawing. And I think that things that you are more inclined towards take less effort for you to learn how to do and get better at. So like me, I'm not athletic, Um, not by a long shot. I'm a little overweight and I'm not very coordinated. And so anything athletics, I couldn't do that. You know, it would take way more effort for me to do something like that than it would for someone else. Whereas with drawing, far, far less effort. So some of it, I would say, is, uh, you know, packaged into who I am. Um, but, well, I don't think it would be fair to say that I, I haven't learned from other people. Of course I have. Of course, consciously and subconsciously, I've adapted things from other people. Um, in some cases, it's purely mechanical, right? So what's an example of that? So when I started doing watercolor, there's this technique called wet on wet. And you might have seen me do it here in these videos where I take a clean brush, I put, I dip it in the water, and then I put the water on the paper, or paint the paper with water, just clean water. And then I put the brush in the water and I get some pigment and then I paint wet on wet. And that's a technique that I learned from YouTube. It's not something that I knew. And, um, so sometimes I look stuff like that up, uh, Sometimes on Instagram, I follow a few other illustrators and you just sort of like look at how they achieve things and you go, okay, well, maybe I can adapt that or, you know, maybe I can do something with that. But in terms of instruction, no, um, it would be fair to say that I have not been instructed in any meaningful way. You know, I took a lot of, a lot, I don't know, a number of art courses in college, uh, not college, I'm sorry, high school, and they were bad took drawing one drawing two painting one and ceramics ceramics was fun um i made this excellent replica mask of truth it was beautiful and then i uh, brought it home and i dropped it so just wound up in the trash <laughs> um i also made this like replica helian like pot like the kind that link throws I, this is 98 this is this is when Ocarina of time came out so you gotta understand um i still have that i think uh, i think i keep arcade tokens in it uh, probably fun spot arcade tokens in that in that pot so yeah that's very old i still have that <laughs> um but and then i took painting one it was painting with acrylics and i was hoping to like learn how to paint and i did not it was just a matter of like, oh, you know, here's the paint, you know, here's the prompt, figure it out. And it's like, I don't know how. And I remember the teacher saying, oh, well, you're, 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 uh, it's very flat, you know, <laughs> like what you're painting looks very flat. There's not, there's no shading. There's no dimension to it. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Cause I don't know how to do that. Can you please teach? Is that that in your job? Can you just teach me how to do that? The answer is no. Uh, she did not. Um, same teacher. I had the same teacher for drawing one and two. But then the same thing there, no real instruction, just like, here's a bowl of fruit, draw it. 
and that was it. And the thing is, I got a better, I mean, I did well in that because I already knew, you know, how to draw more or less, but I wish there was just more like technical instruction and just, there just wasn't. Um, and I went to, you know, I went to a community college. It was like the early 2000s. So, you know, I was more into digital. Well, no, digital art is not the right. Graf, gra- graphic arts. Yeah. So, uh, so like graphic arts, like layout, design, things like that. So, you know, I took courses based around Photoshop and like InDesign, things like that. Um, I would have probably benefited from some art courses in college. I probably would have been better, but no, I was more into Photoshop at that point. Uh, Dill's Garden uh, asks a couple of questions. I'm going to flip flop them for some flow here because the tail end of this video seems to, or the back half anyway, seems to have a have a theme. Uh, Dill's Garden asks, uh, what are some of uh, your, what is your favorite book ever? So what are some of your favorite books? What is your favorite book? I already know we have a shared love of Murakami. So anything other than M. P.S. If you haven't read Dance, Dance, Dance by Murakami, it's a must. Yeah, Dance, Dance, Dance is uh, pretty good. No, Haruki Murakami is my favorite author. I actually own everything he's ever written. I have it all. Just, I have a Murakami shelf. Uh, my favorite books by him are After Dark, Kafka on the Shore, and The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle. Those are my favorite Murakami books. I don't I don't know what my favorite book ever is. I mean, if I had to pick, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I just don't know. Maybe one of those three more comic books. That that's about as far as I can get. Is that that was three, but um, other stuff I like. You know, I like some of those uh, some of the classics that you read in high school. I hated them in high school, and I just feel like all that analysis probably drains the life out of them. And you're like 17, and you'd rather be doing anything than reading The Great Gatsby. Like, dude, I don't know what the green light s- symbolizes. I don't care. But as an adult, uh, I kind of like the tragedy of Great Gatsby. I like the book. I also really Catcher in the Rye. I tend to read it around Christmas. I sometimes joke it's my favorite Christmas movie. Because uh, that's that's also a bit of a tragedy. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the character of Holden Caulfield. He's kind of a tragic, pitiable character. He's not a character you want to emulate. But I can relate to that, that teenage angst. And um, he's also, you know, he has mental health issues. I mean, you know, he's in a hospital at the end of the book. And uh, spoilers, I guess. It's an old book. It's, it, it's you know, I think the statute of limitations is expired. But you know, I can relate to having mental health issues myself and having a challenging uh, upbringing. You know, I can sort of relate to that. I guess. Uh, I like a couple of Cormac McCarthy books. I like The Road and No Country for Old Men. I tried to get into the Border Trilogy, but I couldn't do it. Um, it has some, oh my God, some of the most beautiful passages in those books, but just like narratively, I couldn't get into those books. Um, I like, uh, I like Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse Five, Breakfast of Champions, and shoot, <laughs> I can't think of the other, but the book with Ice Nine in it. Yeah, I can't remember. Shoot. Yeah, I love Kurt Vonnegut. Can't remember the damn name of his books. <laughs> uh, yeah, my bad. Uh, I would say my favorite, like, because you know everyone has a favorite, like, young adult fantasy series. I would say my favorite is um, his Dark Materials, and the primary trilogy for that is the Golden Compass, uh, which is also called Northern Lights in the UK, the Subtle Knife, and the Amber Spyglass, and those are absolutely brilliant there was a golden compass movie a number of years back starring daniel craig and nicole kidman it wasn't very good it was all right but it wasn't very good and uh so the rest of the movies were not made there's a couple of novellas that go along with it and the author philip pullman is doing like a new series with those characters in that universe called the book of dust and the first one came out la belle sauvage and it's the Belle Sauvage is excellent. Like, if we're lumping all of those books together and calling them the series, uh, La Belle Sauvage is the best in the series. is excellent. There's a, a new one coming out soon called The Secret Commonwealth. Uh, maybe this year for Lucky? I don't know. But I really enjoy those. Um, but Dill's Garden 
also asks, uh, I've been curious about reading books for self-help and feeling content and happy with what I have in life instead of always wanting more or feeling my life isn't good enough. Do you have any recommendations? And I mean, I don't know if I have the exact recommendations you're looking for, for that situation. Um, that's hard to say, right? Uh, it's hard to imagine what someone else's life is like and finding the panacea for that. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I, you know, I've had, I don't know, I've had some malaise, some ennui in my thirties here, partially because they haven't been as exciting as my twenties. And last year, you know, in this midst of being laid off from my job, um, having this neck injury, you know, just these bad things that are hitting me, uh, it, and with my wedding coming up, this good thing that's supposed to be coming, um, you know, I, I took the time to read two books that really helped me. The first was called uh, Ikigai by Hector Garcia and Francesc Morales. And, you know, it's about this, um, I don't know, Japanese philosophy or mindset about living well. And it's, it's, I found it to be really helpful. There, there are a number of cornerstones to the book. Um, you know, part of it's like eating well, getting some physical activity. The book mentions gardening, you know, it doesn't have to be like aerobic exercise or anything. It just means some physical activity, being social. Uh, and the final one is having, you know, your life purpose, your ikigai. And I think for me, you know, I, I think I discovered that illustrating was that for me. I hope that illustrating is something that, you know, I can do. I don't know if I want to say I want to do it for work, but just something I can do more often. Maybe it brings in more money. I don't know. But I realized that that's what I, you know, all this time in my life that I have spent not illustrating. You know, I've been denying myself that. And being laid off from my job and having that time to discover that myself was actually a good thing that came out from that. And learning and, and relating that to the Ikigai book. Ikigai, is, it's I-K-I-G-A-I. It's just very helpful. It's on Amazon. And the other book, uh, I don't know if this is surprising to people, is The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo who is very popular right now because she has a Netflix TV show. Uh, I would say the book is far more valuable than the TV show. I don't find, I didn't, I, you know, I've watched, I think most of the TV show at this point, sort of hate watching it. Uh, Cause I don't think it gives Marie's philosophy enough credit and is more about like the before and after of like a messy home and now it's clean. And you know, it's very Americanized and very sensational and uh, it doesn't do a lot for me. Because honestly, the book is a lot about organization. It is about getting rid of stuff. It is about organization. It is about cleaning up. You know, that is, that is, you know, a major component of the book. But it's more than that. And this is what's really helped me here. It's, it's not about, it's not just about what you get rid of around your home. It's about what you keep. Because what you keep is who you really are. If you are like a lot of other people, you have amassed a ton of stuff. And this stuff, you know, it can weigh on you. It's like, oh, I got all this crap in boxes under my bed in my closet. Dude, get rid of it. It's in a box. You haven't seen it in years. Get rid of it. Oh, it's sentimental. The thing isn't sentimental. The memory is sentimental. You can recycle or sell the thing and still have the emotion attached to it, you know. Or, you know, oh, I got this guitar and it's been sitting in the corner of my room for the past two years. I haven't touched it. I should play guitar. Okay, if you really want to, sure. But... If you haven't touched it in two years, maybe you actually don't want to play guitar. Maybe that's not your thing. Maybe you should sell the guitar because looking at the guitar and thinking you should be playing it is causing you all this stress. Sell it. Use the money to do something that you're more into. You know, shave away the layers of yourself that are actually not you, that you've just sort of accumulated over the years. And what you have left is who you really are. And that's, to me, the major takeaway from that book. Not cleaning, not getting rid of stuff, finding who you really are. I think a big example for that for me is my bookshelf. Um, I had hundreds of books. I love to read, you know, and I love books. And I got rid of books that I like. 
but it's not about liking them. It's just, you know, they don't, I don't need to hold on to this book that I'm never going to read again. Um, simply because it, it looks, I look, <laughs> I look smart having all these books, you know? And so you look at my bookshelves now and, and they, you know, uh, they better represent me. You can look at these bookshelves and get a sense of exactly who I am. You know, one shelf is all Haruki Murakami's books. One shelf is all my Japanese language and culture and travel books. Another shelf is reading books. Um, well, I was going to say fiction, but that's not entirely true. There's some nonfiction on there. Like I have Brian Wilson's biography, for instance. So, you know, reading books. Another shelf is video game books. You know, some of the stuff like, you know, the Zelda Dark Horse books, like Art and Artifacts and the Zelda Encyclopedia and things like that. Hyrule Historia. But also things like written by Ian Bogust or Jay McGonigal, or like, you know, a thousand and one games you must play before you die. Um, and then another shelf is, you know, all my comics and graphic novels and trade paperbacks. Uh, I don't read a ton of comics, but, you know, I do enjoy Saga and Paper Girls. Uh, you know, I have Scott Pilgrim. I like Scott Pilgrim. So, but you can look at that shelf and you can see exactly who I am in a way that you could not see before because there's just so much noise on my bookshelves. And I think that's a good example of how Marie Kondo's philosophy, if you actually follow the book, works. I'm a, I'm, I, I'm a believer. I, I, I think that it's excellent. But you gotta, you gotta give it a chance. And in that sense, you know, getting rid of stuff, making money, clearing space, and finding, you know, the things that are actually, that actually matter to you, you know? A lot can be said for what that book actually brings. The TV show, not so much. You know, the nuts to the TV show. Don't watch that. But the book is great. Um, and on that subject, I mean, on the subject of Marie Kondo and tidying up, we have a couple more questions here. Um, Black Fox 2240 asks, have you continued to trim the fat from your collection? Uh, how were you able to get rid of titles that weren't worth much? Uh, after your update video on it, how has the process been? So I did a couple of videos about trimming the fat from my video game collection. Uh, my collection was <laughs> unwieldy, massive. It was like 60, 70, you know, consoles. Uh, I think it was pretty close to 2,500 games. And then just all the merchandise. Like that was a huge category unto itself, which is like all like the, the figures, the statues, the pre-order bonuses, the plushes, just all that stuff just adds up. It was so much stuff. And, you know, we're going to roll it into with uh, Orca 22's question here. I have never used eBay to sell anything before, and I'm not familiar to many other ways to do it. Is there a best way to sell games and collectibles from your experience? How did you go about selling yours? So, you know, we can roll these together. So I have continued to trim the fat from my collection. It's a whole process. And, you know, if you want me to talk more about that in another video, please let me know. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. You know, we don't... I don't I don't really think we have the time to do it in this one, maybe. Um, but I did continue to trim the fat. You know, the funny thing is, is that I was applying similar methods to Marie Kondo before I even read her book when I started trimming the fat from my collection. And I've continued to do that. You know, I continue to determine like, well, this really isn't me or, you know, I don't want to maintain this collection anymore or whatever. I've continued to just work it down to you know, really more who I am. I would say that that's DS and 3DS primarily, um, as well as the Game Boy line, uh, to some extent, uh, PSP and Vita. And then, you know, to lesser extents, um, the Nintendo 64 and the Dreamcast. Um, cause those are all just meaningful systems to me. I mean, I have some NES games, I have some SNES games, but I don't really, you know, those are pretty small collections overall, and I don't, I don't really add to them very often. In fact, I can't remember the last time I bought an NES game, man. Um, but you know, I whittled it down to like Nintendo handhelds, Sony handhelds, and like the Nintendo 64 and the Dreamcast, because that was just that era of gaming was just very valuable for me, and. Uh, you know, it just took time. It took time to narrow it down to that because it's hard. It's hard to get rid of stuff. Um, 
but as for how I got rid of the titles, um, I, you know, I sold high ticket items on eBay. I don't really recommend, e I don't like eBay as a seller. As a buyer, you get a lot of protections, and if you use it smartly, eBay's just fine as a buyer. As a seller, unless unless you're like a power seller and you're selling thousands of things, you know, you got a good relationship with the post office, you got a stamps.com account or whatever, like it's, it's, unless you're doing all that, it's really not worth it. Um, you know, I did sell a few high ticket items on eBay because the money I made for them was worth, you know, the time, the hassle. Um, it was worth, uh, you know, the cut that both eBay and PayPal take. It's worth the postage. Um, you know, you also have to contend with the fact that, like, it may not sell. And that's frustrating. And you also have to contend with the fact that the person might return it. Or they might even rip you off. Um, that's always bound to happen. I've had, you know, I've, I've purchased hundreds of things through eBay. And I've had, you can count on one hand how many bad bad experiences I've had. It's not often. Um, as a seller, I've never had a bad experience, but I've sold very few things on eBay. Um, I have a local video game store chain. Well, it, it's like a nerd, retro nerd shop. They sell like secondhand games and they sell comic books and tabletop stuff. Uh, they host like, you know, Friday Night Magic. A lot of like old toys. So people will sell their stuff to them and they have like five locations. And they keep it pretty well stocked. So, you know, if you if you come in with, like, a big collection, they'll take the crappy games along with the good ones if it means buying the whole collection. Um, someone might still buy that crappy game. I mean, after all, I did at one point. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll just bring in a bunch of stuff and just go, well, here it is. And you're not, you're not going to get what it's quote-unquote worth. But worth can be very fluid and hypothetical. Like, a game, you can look on eBay and all these listings and go, okay, well, this game is worth $20, but it's... It's really only actually worth twenty dollars if someone buys it, and of course, subtract the fees and the shipping and all that. And what are you really left with anyway? It's a very hypothetical value. Um, you're not, you're probably not going to get close to that if you sell it to a retro shop, but you're going to get some money. And if money is the the key thing to you, well. You know, maybe maybe you stick it out with eBay, but if just getting some money and clearing the space, you know, if other aspects to selling it are more important than the money, then I do recommend that. That's what I did. Um, I mean, there are other avenues like Facebook. Facebook has a selling feature, and then there's Craigslist. The Facebook selling thing is a lot like Craigslist. And, you know, I've heard that sometimes people aren't, the buyers aren't great, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, if you're selective and careful should be okay. Uh, I sold some things to family and friends. My sister was one of my biggest customers. My sister got a lot of my stuff. And I sold it to her for like deep discounts, you know? Because like, yeah, I wanted some money, but money wasn't the only object to me. So like, you know, like my sister got my copy of Panzer Dragoon Saga for, I don't know, like a hundred bucks. <laughs> and that's, that's fine. It went to someone who's going to appreciate it. You know, I'm never going to play it again. I have no nostalgic attachment to it went to someone who's going to appreciate it. And I still made a, I still, Oh, I didn't make a hundred bucks. Cause I spent, I don't know, 150 on it. So yeah. So I, technically I lost $50 on that game, but that's okay. Like that's fine. You know, you, you can't look at video games as stocks. You're probably not going to get out of them what you spent. So, but, uh, those are, those are all avenues. People, you know, you know, Google around for retro video game stores in your area. eBay is one of them, but I would really only recommend that for two things. One is high ticket items, and the other is bulk collections. Like if you're just selling like all of your GameCube games and you got like a hundred of them. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you know, if you folks want me to talk more about, you know, how I trimmed the fat, how I came to that conclusion, like the emotional impact, because there's a little bit of emotional impact in that and things like that. I'll be happy to do it in a future video. So let me know, but uh, good luck. Good luck to both of you getting rid of your, rid of your stuff. Um, you're not, you're not going to, you're not going to make a ton of money off of it, you know, unless you're on eBay or unless you make being on eBay, your full-time job, that's just not, it's not going to happen. But, uh, you can probably make an amount of money that you're happy with or you're content with that you can live with. 
and then you should be okay. And you'll clear up space and you can refocus your collection on things you things you really appreciate and enjoy. You can recondo your collection. You can chisel away at all that you own and reveal, you know, who you who you really are, what you really enjoy. And I think that's exciting. I think it's the best part of the process. Um, but that's all we have today. Uh, you know, we're, we're almost wrapped up here with this video, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was relaxing. I hope you got something out of it. And again, if you if you want to ask a question, feel free to leave a comment. You can leave a comment for comment's sake. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram where I talk largely about video games and post pictures of video games and illustrations. I'm at TV and Lust on both, and the links are in the description. I'm also a co-host of the Ludo Wave Radio podcast, and that's pretty much anywhere where you can find podcasts. You just look up Ludo Wave Radio. But uh, uh, thanks for tuning in. I, I really hope you enjoyed. I hope that these these videos are resonating with people. I've I've gotten some very positive feedback. You know, the audience is not big. But the people who, who are watching do seem to enjoy it. That, that means a lot to me. So thank you. And um, we're going to wrap up this art here. We're going to have a shot at the end of the finished product. And uh, yeah, until next time, you guys take it easy. <laughs>